The Lillian McDermott Show. We love, we fear, bridges we burn, we make mistakes, then we live and learn, when life gets tough, and it seems like your best ain't good enough. If you're in need of hope, you know where I'll be, I'll be right here. Right here, and when you need a friend, you can count on me. I'll be right here, right here, waiting for you. This is the place you can always turn to when you need a friend. The Lillian McDermott Show. To reach out to Lillian, visit her on the web at whenyouneedafriend.com. Now let's all learn together. Here's Lillian McDermott. Hello, my listening and viewing friend. It's so nice we can meet each other on the air on this beautiful best day ever. And for those of you who are tuning into the classroom for the first time, please know I've been waiting for you. This is a safe place where you can go to when you need a friend. It is my commitment to provide natural ways to heal. And it is my mission to make awareness, responsibility, and truth a part of our everyday life. And I hope you, my listening and viewing friend, will feel empowered to embrace new truth and live the life of your dreams. Well, as you know, Dr. Thomas Levy is one of my favorite. I, I love the teachers in the classroom. Dr. Thomas Levy, we've done some, some workshops together and he's taught us all about vitamin C, um, hydrogen peroxide, even methylene blue. Uh, he's taught us so many things and we've, we've done the roadmap to health and for practitioners, we've done optimal treatment of disease. And he has just constantly been teaching us some of tr some truths that are suppressed in the media and maybe do don't cost that much money but help our health improve in the long term and so one of the books that we give away whenever we do a workshop is magnesium it's about magnesium and how you can reverse uh, disease with magnesium. But there are certain things that we need to know before we head down that direction. And as a cardiologist, Dr. Thomas Levy, and a, a JD, a, a Juris Doctorate, uh, can testify that there are so many different opinions, beliefs, research, interpretations of the research. And so Dr. Thomas Levy is back to talk to us about magnesium and how magnesium can help heal our, our bodies and our mind and our spirit. And since it is our sole purpose in life to give and receive love and, love and knowledge, I am grateful that Dr. Thomas Levy is here to do just that. Welcome back, Dr. Levy, to the classroom. Hi, Lily. Glad to be back. It's nice to see you. It's always nice to catch up with you too. We need to make sure we get you on once a month so we can at least have that date where we can talk to each other. So let's talk about, you know, as a cardiologist, you focused on, you know, take, you know, the traditional, this is the allopathic traditional medicine that you've learned in life. But then all of a sudden you're falling into or you're stumbling into other truths that could potentially help your patients even more but they don't line up with the training that you received. So I do want to ask this question from you before we get started is how do you get the strength? Where do you get the strength and how difficult was it for you to step out of the box as a classically trained medical doctor, cardiologist? Well, <clears throat> that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not a Superman or anything like that, but my mindset has always been for me, I can't speak for other people, to follow where logic and information leads me. Uh, and if it's leading me down a pathway that everybody else rejects for one reason or another, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I enjoy being liked and loved as much as anybody else, but that's not the primary reason that I go in a certain direction. I mean, as a physician, it might sound corny, as a physician, my goal is to help as many people as possible uh, with uh, good interventions for their illnesses with, with as minimal an impact on their pocket as possible so that it reaches more people. And, and if that conflicts with other people, well, that, that's their problem, not mine. 
And that's true. And that's where you get the strength that you're, you're, you're seeking that, um, that new information that leads to logic. And this is where I want to start because when we think of magnesium uh, and I, it's amazing prior to doing this show, um, I started looking at asking people, how much magnesium do you take? What kind of magnesium do you take? And there's a lot of misconception. Many people have told me I never take magnesium. And I know that there are different reasons why people take magnesium, calming them down, helping them sleep better. But let's really dive into magnesium and uh, let's talk about the importance of magnesium. Is it essential to our, um, our, can we get it in our diet? Is it essential mineral that we need to have or, or supplement that we need to have? So what would you say about that? No, it's absolutely essential. <clears throat> and like so many other things, we've been inundated with toxins at, at a going up at an exponential rate. And for those who haven't listened in the past or are not aware, all disease is caused by oxidative stress, which is what a toxin does. A toxin only harms you to the degree that it oxidizes, takes electrons away from biomolecules. And the more it does that, the sicker you are. And the whole goal then is to with different agents, reduce those biomolecules back to their normal function. And uh, at the same time, identify and eliminate new toxins. So the problem is, is even though magnesium is not an antioxidant per se, it's probably the most essential mineral that, it, that exists to sustain a normal intracellular environment, a normal intracellular metabolism. What do I mean by that? Well, we've talked in the past about calcium and about the horrible <laughs> supplementation of calcium. And again, it's a big subject, but I'll summarize it by saying that all disease, 100% of all disease is characterized by, associated with, and caused by excessive calcium inside the cells that are affected. So whatever it is, a toxin, an infection, any disease you can imagine, the underlying pathophysiology is excessive calcium inside the cell. The higher it goes, the higher the oxidative stress, and when it gets too high, the cell either becomes malignant or simply dies, okay? So the malignant cells have the highest oxidative stress. Now, why is all this important relative to magnesium? <clears throat> magnesium is nature's natural anti-calcium agent. It directly antagonizes most of the metabolic reactions that calcium is involved with. <clears throat> but most importantly, it's a direct what's called calcium channel antagonist. In other words, there are portals that go across the cell membrane that selectively are used to bring calcium inside the cell because the calcium concentration inside the cell is infinitesimal compared to the calcium concentration outside the cell. Mm -hmm. So you're always facing needing to use up energy to keep calcium out of the cell because the, the concentration gradient, if it, wasn't, uh, if it wasn't blocked by access with these channels, we just flood the inside of the cells with calcium. So magnesium, as it turns out, is the primary what's called calcium channel blocker. So the more magnesium you take, the higher you get it in your blood and in your extracellular fluid, the more readily you can bring calcium levels down inside the cell and literally, not figuratively, but literally make any disease less of a problem, less pathological. And in many cases, they're caused by magnesium deficiency and that would completely block that at all. So it primes the cell by bringing the calcium down and then allowing the introduction of more vitamin C and the synthesis of more glutathione and all the things that are needed to make a normal cell. But bottom line is magnesium, you know, and uh, people that know about me and vitamin C and all, I got to say this, just for dramatic effect, I might add, because I would never just say there's one supplement you need and nothing else. But for the sake of argument, if you had to choose one supplement and one supplement only, 
I'd make it magnesium. Why is that? Because when you have a magnesium deficiency, nothing takes care of the deficiency other than magnesium. There's no crossover with other agents. When you're depleted of vitamin C, obviously you still need lots of vitamin C, but when you're depleted of vitamin C, there are other antioxidants if you take in large amounts that can partially, and I emphasize partially, compensate for the lack of vitamin C. But when you're depleted in magnesium, as most people are, the only thing that takes care of that, well, I shouldn't say takes care of that, lessens that because it's very difficult in this sea of toxins in which we live ever to really get your magnesium levels inside the cell at a normal level. That's the goal. We don't really reach it, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do as much as possible to get as close to that goal as possible. You know, as I listen to you talk about magnesium and the importance of magnesium, I would be, um, oh gosh, I wouldn't be serving myself or others if I don't shift right now and talk about calcium, because calcium is um, a vitamin, a supplement that a lot of people think they must have for bone health. And I know that in your book, you address the fact that that is not truth. So let's set the record straight when it comes to calcium and who should take calcium and why should we take calcium? Well, the answer to the question is nobody should take calcium. That's the, that's the first answer. <laughs> I knew that was your answer, but okay. I wanted to hear you say it. <clears throat> calcium, iron, and copper. And I just wrote an article on this that's going to be coming out on the Orthomolecular Medicine News Service in a few days. People can go to orthomolecular.org and sign up for that and receive it for free. Calcium, copper, and iron are what I call the three toxic nutrients. And it's not meant to be glib or to be silly, but they definitely nutrients at low levels of intake, very low levels of intake, because most of the time, all you need of those metals is to be recycled inside the body, not to have more added into it. So as it turns out, what did I just say about calcium with regard to magnesium? All pathology, 100%. The pathology is if you have a quote unquote disease cell or sick cell that's not working the way it should, 100% of the time, you have excessive amounts of calcium inside the cytoplasm and that cell will never get healthy by any measurement until you can bring those calcium levels down to normal. And of course, magnesium is one of the ways to do it. I don't wanna say it's the only way, but it's one of the most important ways of doing that. So what happens is with calcium specifically, of course, we have the incredible rabid marketing efforts of the dairy industry, and they're pretty much largely successful because as you pointed out already, I mean, it's still a mania around the world that calcium is good for you. Take as much as you can. Uh, try to buy some orange juice and they spike calcium into it. They just got to put it everywhere. I even once saw calcium enriched milk, which really blows my mind because it's, it's, it's already a calcium overdose as it is. And I would never recommend drinking milk for any reason at all. Now, that said, then, it's always a lot of a paradox because of what we see, what we see around us. Everybody does it. The doctors do it. The thing is, is nobody wants to look at the literature. When I say nobody, of course, I'm talking about the doctors. You can't expect the lay public to be pouring through the literature. But mm -hmm. I mean, there is nothing more immovable than the glacier called modern medicine. I mean, it just sits in one spot and doesn't budge a bit no matter what new significant information comes in, unless of course uh, it uh, fuels the purchase of astronomically priced pharmaceuticals. All of these things we're talking about are of no consequential expense at all. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand that something does not support and strongly promote the incredible overbearing, greedy money grubbing machine called modern medicine, then you're just not paying attention. 
<laughs> I love how you put things. There, no uncertain term do we not understand clearly what you're trying to say, but yet we ignore what you're saying because we're so programmed to believe that milk does the body good, that you get your calcium. And if you have osteoporosis, you better drink milk. And I remember when Robert was diagnosed with uh, osteopenia, I think that's what he was diagnosed with, and he can come on the air if he wants to talk about it. He was told that um, he had to take, I, I believe he had to take calcium um, for that. And, uh, and you know, th they're, they're focusing on the reason why you have osteopenia, osteoporosis is because of a lack of calcium, but you say it's the opposite, right? It's too much calcium. Well, this is where they play with the language. Okay. Osteoporotic and osteopenic bone is very depleted of calcium. It's very depleted of many other things as well, but it's also depleted of calcium. It's like uh, oxidation is a burn. So like uh, if you light up wood and burn it, the smoke goes away. Well, the oxidative burning of bone puts off calcium, but just taking calcium is not gonna make that bone healthy again any more than taking smoke is going to reinforce the wood that just got burned. It's a very complex process. And all the taking of calcium does by itself is cause massive calcium deposition throughout the body mm -hmm. where you're not only not depleted of calcium, you already have an excess of calcium because your osteoporosis has been burning, if you will, and putting off calcium, some of which gets excreted in the urine and the rest that gets deposited throughout the body. So is there a deficiency of calcium in the bones? Yes. Is there a deficiency of calcium in the body? Not even close, there's an excess. So what do you suggest we do? <clears throat> and what I think you're going to, what I think you're, what is the issue here is that we need to increase our magnesium to block the calcium. Is that what I'm concluding from what you said earlier? <laughs> well, yes, you, you need to take the things that help build new bone and you have to take the things that help uh, suppress bone breakdown. Uh, and as it turns out, <clears throat> the big four supplements I call them the big four primarily because each one independently in decreases all cause mortality, decreases your chance of death from anything. And by chance, each one of them is a potent uh, inhibitor of calcium deposition and calcium excess inside the cell. And they're vitamin C, they're vitamin D, vitamin K2, and magnesium. Each one of those independently decreases your chance of death from anything. And they decrease your chance of death from anything primarily because of the beneficial effect they have on intracellular calcium metabolism and helping mobilize and redissolve calcium de deposits throughout your body where you don't want them. I mean, you don't want calcium deposited anywhere in your body except inside your bones. Mm -hmm. And what does, what will help bone growth? Uh, so what you're saying is that taking vitamin C, D, K2, and magnesium will help with bone growth, or is that just a combination that will help keep calcium out of our body? No, both. They help with bone growth. I mean, there's a number of studies quite dramatic that show that high doses of calcium do help rebuild new bone. Now, having said that, I want people to understand, especially the older folks and the older ladies that have already had a diagnosis of osteoporosis for some years, don't think for a second that suddenly taking everything right supplemental wise is going to bring your bones back to where they were when you're 40 years old. That's not going to happen. The goal here is to stop the new breakdown of bone and rebuild a little bit. Okay, that's the goal. I mean, you can't undo 20, 25, 30 years of damage with uh, a couple months or a couple years of supplementation with anything. Mm -hmm. So that's the important thing to remember. And it's also important to remember that the real criteria, especially in the case of calcium and osteoporosis, the real criteria of success is, does this decrease the incidence of fracture? If it doesn't increase the incidence of fracture, then 
from your body's point of view, from your health point of view, it's worthless as a treatment for osteoporosis if it doesn't decrease their chance of fracture and make the bone stronger. Mm -hmm. And that's only a problem because just by chance, calcium supplementation actually makes the number on a bone density test improve, but does not improve the quality of the bone. So you have a lot of docs out there, get them on a lot of calcium. They say, oh, your bone density has gone up two or three or four points. It's got nothing to do with bone strength. Whereas on the other hand, when you don't take calcium and you take large amounts of vitamin C, you see the same increase in the bone density, but that means it's quality bone. I like to say in the case of calcium, it's like, putting fresh coats of white paint on a rotting fence. It looks prettier, but if you lean against it, it breaks. Wow, great image. That is a great image because that's basically what's happening um, to to when when we're looking, when you're talking about this image. Um, I, I know that um, people who have taken Fosamax um, or the other um, drug that they put people on to improve the bone, um, it's causing other problems like uh, making the bones more brittle, um, causing problems with the jaw and the teeth and the mouth, but they don't talk about that. Um, they just say, oh, we need to do this real quick. So if somebody's received a diagnosis of osteopenia or osteoporosis, what is your best advice for them? Why don't you re recap? Well, I mean, as you said, I, I give away a lot of these books for free as far as the ebooks go. So this is no way I'm trying to promote it. But uh, that's why I wrote Death by Calcium. And that's the best way, best place to go uh, to see all of the research involved, see all the data that's involved, and to see the recommended protocols. You know, I can't give you everything in a few seconds or a minute or two that's covered in the book, but the book covers it very well. And it's a good guideline for people to, <clears throat> to also realize it's not too late, okay? I mean, if you're 80 years old and you've been doing the wrong thing your whole life, you can still make a significant difference in your general health and your chances of having an osteoporotic fracture. <clears throat> the real nasty part about the osteoporotic fracture is that has all the older folks scared to death, mm -hmm. I suppose, as it should. But they also have the studies that show the more calcium you take, not only do you not decrease your chance of the osteoporotic fracture, which is bad, which can ultimately kill you, no doubt about it, but you massively increase your chances of heart disease and cancer. So, you know, there's no point in taking something that's going to give you a worse disease than the one you're trying to prevent, but not even effectively preventing that at all. Yeah, you're not the first person that has said calcium is not good because what I'm hearing you say is that calcium, when you take it in, it goes into the cell and causes a, a, a toxification of our of our cell and the magnesium. Um, so uh, with, okay, what about taking calcium naturally? Does it do the same thing? Because there are products that we eat, vegetables, and that have a, a natural uh, calcium. Is that... Is that good or is it just the, the supplements that you're talking about? Well, that's where you should be getting your calcium. Okay. Not, not necessarily because of the form that it's in, but because outside of dairy, okay, outside of dairy, there really are no foods that massively overdose you on calcium. Dairy does overdose you on calcium. Uh, and this is why vitamin D3 comes into play because when you're supplementing vitamin D appropriately, keeping your blood level in the range, I think of 50 to 100 mm -hmm. nanogram per cc, then you're putting in your body the regulator that determines how much calcium should be absorbed from the food that you eat. Okay. So a perfectly normal vitamin D3 level is critical for you to absorb and assimilate the appropriate amount of calcium from your diet. And while at the same time, as I just said, obviously over, not overdosing on the super high calcium foods. Very good. So you talked about C, D3, K2, and magnesium. So let's go back to magnesium because we all know that with vitamin C, um, with vitamin C, uh, you take enough to have uh, to battle tolerance or you're symptom free. 
So that's how I take vitamin C. And usually I will take in a day between, I don't know, um, 6,000 to 15,000 or more, depending on how I'm feeling. And these are milligrams. So what would be the um, equivalent to magnesium? How do you know that you've had enough magnesium or, and then I want to know which one's the best magnesium because there's a lot of different kinds of magnesiums. Well, this gets a little frustrating for people and it's yep. frustrating for me because they want precise answers that I can't give them. So what I need to say is that magnesium is so severely depleted in nearly everybody's body that you're never going to take too much if you take it orally. You can very quickly take too much if you take it intravenously, but orally has the same, shall we say, effect as vitamin C. When you take too much, it causes a loose diarrhea. I mean, remember when you anybody gets a colonoscopy, what do they give you before the colonoscopy? They give you magnesium <laughs> citrate, citrate, so you just poop your brains out, okay? So it's, <laughs> it's very clearly going to do that when you get too much in your bowel, which very much means that in the same fashion that you take vitamin C intermittently, so you absorb a greater percentage with spilling less uh, down into the uh, lower part of the GI tract, it's the same thing with magnesium. Uh, you, you, the best way is to take it uh, intermittently on whatever dose you can tolerate. It's the same sort of look for the right dose for yourself and for somebody who, let's say, is extremely sensitive to magnesium, I mean, there's a few people extremely sensitive to vitamin C. They take one gram and they I get know. new schools. Yeah. But if the same thing is the case with the, with the magnesium, you have other options to at least bolster it. I mean, mm -hmm. magnesium is very well absorbed through the skin. They have magnesium oils, magnesium sprays, different lotions. Uh, they have the, uh, the magnesium chloride crystals you could put into your bath and do a soak uh, in that way, Epsom salts. Uh, and periodically, when you ever get a chance, you take it intravenously. I mean, I like to tell people and docs that magnesium is so critical, I don't care what you're getting an IV for, don't miss the opportunity to add magnesium to it because so much more of that is retained by your body than by even an astronomical oral dose. Now, one other form of magnesium that's very, very good, it's pricier, but for people where price is not as much of a problem with others, but they want a high quality product, you get a lot of magnesium where you want it to go, is the uh, liposome encapsulated uh, magnesium three and eight. Uh, right now, the only place that carries that, I believe, is Live On Labs. Uh, and the liposome, true liposome encapsulation is incredibly well suited toward just like the liposome encapsulated vitamin C, getting completely absorbed and not dumping a large amount of vitamin C or magnesium lower into the gut to cause the osmotic intake of fluid to give you the loose diarrhea. So those are your basic uh, uh, options there. Uh, in the book, you know, people, uh, I put down a number, I don't even remember the numbers of how much magnesium you just start taking, but that's not to be considered uh, one size fits all. You should really, as I said, try to find yourself a comfortable maximal dose of magnesium that you can take at least two, if not three times a day, like the vitamin C, uh, that still falls short of causing you to have the, uh, the frequency of bowel movements. Okay, so, okay, you talk about magnesium three and eight, is that what you called three it? And eight, right. Three and eight. Okay, so magnesium three and eight has an ability to find what, what's needed, but there's about, I think I calculated uh, maybe 11 or 12, um, and even when people, when people promote the different kinds of magnesium, there's always something missing like chelated magnesium or, um, you know, you know, um, there were so many aspartate magnesium. That was a new one that I had never heard of before. Um, so when you take a different magnesium, does it fall short 
Does it not know? Should you take something that has a lot of different kinds of magnesium? So do you create this balance? Because I know that Dr. Lee Cowden, and I had mentioned this to you before, Dr. Lee Cowden says malate is the best magnesium that you can take. But what about chelated? What about, you know, oxide? Or what about, you know, um, you know, tyrate, you know, glycinate? How do you know which one is right for you? Well, I'll let the lawyer part of me answer this and say it depends. <laughs> okay. And that is something that gets lost on supplementation in general, for most supplements, not all of them, is you have a compound that has a cation and an anion. It's got a positive charge part and a negative charge part. Okay. With a vitamin C, you have hydrogen ascorbate, ascorbic acid. You have sodium ascorbate, sodium positive, ascorbate negative calcium ascorbate, magnesium ascorbate. These are all different forms of vitamin C that deliver vitamin C very well, but you also have to deal with the fact that you're dosing a cation that's associated with it. And does that cation have any unique positive or negative factors that should be taken into consideration with your supplementation? Uh, and if all, with all due respect to Dr. Cowden, I would never just say that there's one form of magnesium that's best for anybody. Mm -hmm. No, there's too many different factors involved. Uh, and the measure of the magnesium product, and this might seem silly at first, is not per se just how much magnesium you get inside your body until you figure out the impact of the anion. One of the things that I talk about a lot in the book, uh, most recent book, actually not the magnesium book, because that was before the pandemic. But since the pandemic has started, a little bit more research has shown, for example, that magnesium sulfate, which actually is the most common form of intravenous magnesium, although you can get magnesium chloride too, but magnesium sulfate in test tube circumstances with viruses, increases viral replication, whereas magnesium chloride suppresses replication. So uh, when it comes to the pandemic, I recommend magnesium chloride. Now that's not to say that's the only form that's good for you. That's not to say, but I say, why not take something that does, does is doing some good with the anion as well as the cation. We have a lot of examples of what the chloride does as an anti-infection agent. I mean, I think many of us have mothers and grandmothers who maybe when we were young or know of somebody you start to get a little sore throat, what do they do? They gargle with salt water. It's not the sodium that's helping you out, it's the chloride. Okay, so anything that bumps up the chloride is its own good independent anti-pathogen. Uh, in the past, back in 1938, Dr. Klenner cured 60 cases of polio with different applications of vitamin C. Well, at about the same time in France, a Dr. Nouveau using just magnesium chloride oral solution cured virtually just as many polio cases, even some that were advanced by taking that orally. And some of the younger babies, he had them well in uh, 12 to 48 hours. So, you know, look at every, look at all your information. And whenever you're dealing with any supplement, like I say, look at the anion, look at the cation. Magnesium glycinate, glycine. Glycine is an important amino acid that many people are low on. So if you think that's the case with your patient, you give them magnesium glycinate, they're getting magnesium as well as glycine. Same thing, you have to review. Magnesium threonate, the one that's liposome encapsulated, uh, it's been shown to see to be selectively um, taken up or uh, or assimilated in the brain. Okay, so that's if you're dealing with somebody that's having a little more uh, CNS problems, neurological problems, and that would be a choice for them. But the point is, is they all have their unique aspects, and you just can't take a uh, non-analytical approach toward a supplement when you can take a few moments, go online, not rocket science, and just look at the different effects of the different aspects of the supplement that you're, that you're taking.
Very good. Very good advice because there is information for, you know, this kind of magnesium does this, it's, it's what it's known for, but you know, it's like, I wish there was one pill that had every single magnesium. So like little soldiers coming out into your body, just taking care of whatever they need to take care of, but I don't think it is this right now, but before we go any further in our conversation with Dr. Thomas Levy, I just wanted to talk about um, going to when you need a friend.com where this is where you have lots of different topics that you can go and find out how you can be your own MD, your own medical detective, discover different ways that are different and new to heal as naturally as possible. And so go to when you need a friend.com while you're there, please subscribe, like, and follow me on all social media. Um, also check out my sponsor, uh, check out and support them the way that they are supporting the classroom. And uh, there's also a shop now bag. You can support the classroom by going to the shop now bag and looking at Lily Approve products from head to toe. Uh, these are products that I use myself. And it's a, it's a, some of these products are affiliates so that they help provide um, some form of monetary to a uh, value to the, the classroom, but it's very, very little, but at least you are helping the classroom grow. Uh, and last but not least, you can become an enrolled student in the classroom. So whether it's a dollar or a thousand dollars a month or one-time donation, whatever you can provide, costs have increased exponentially. And so trying to help uh, in the classroom, whatever you can, whether it's your time, your talent, your treasure. We also have uh, two events that are going on next week. We have the Super Gut that starts on August 1st through, uh, through September 5th. Every Tuesday night, we're going to come together with Dr. Uh, William Davis, and he is going to guide us in how to improve our microbiome. So please join us. If you have not signed up, please sign up. You can also, if, if the Tuesday night courses are going to be recorded, so you can watch those at your convenience as well. And then we have the Emotion Code with Dr. Bradley Nelson. That's going to be live in person in Cape Canaveral, Florida with Dr. Bradley Nelson. It's going to be the Emotion Code and the Body Code. So check out those two uh, pop-ups when you go to whenyouneedafriend.com and start your journey towards um, improving your health, your life, whatever it is that you're looking for. So today we have Dr. Um, Thomas Levy, MDJD, and he has done many workshops. If you go to the workshops, one is for um, practitioners. It's called Optimal Treatment of Disease. You can go in there, click on it, and um, purchase the product that you want. Or op, uh, we have the um, Roadmap to Health, which is for regular people like you and I that have want to know how to take our health back. Wonderful, wonderful uh, time with Dr. Thomas Levy. Uh, you get his books called Rapid Virus Recovery, Primal Pyrenecia, Death by Calcium, Magnesium Reversing Disease, and Hidden Epidemic which, uh, you know, are great um, PDFs to get as well. Uh, so with that in mind, you could also go to peakenergy.com to learn more about Dr. Thomas Levy and the work that he's doing. I'm just so grateful to you, Dr. Levy, and it's always exciting to hear your research, your perspective, and give us the, the information so that we too can go and look at the research. Because if we just repeat what you're saying, it's no different than repeating what an allopathic doctor who has never heard what you've said before. It's so we, we need to make it our own truth. And we can go to pubmed.gov. We can go to the orthomolecular um, newsletters that they have. There's so many different ways that you can verify some of these things that are right for you. So thank you, Dr. Tom, D Dr. Levy, for, for doing everything that you do to help us um, learn new information. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. And okay. So now let's take a little turn because um, we talked about um, the, the doses and the, do and it's still, it's still puzzling to me, which one I should take uh, for magnesium. And what I'm hearing you say that ultimately we need to decide that. Um, but there is, there are some that kind of replicate the other magnesiums, the trionate? Three and eight, yes. Three and eight, <clears throat> yeah. I hit the, the three, the tri, <laughs> three and eight. No, like I said, they, they all, they're all they all going to give you magnesium. And 
Uh, as you mentioned, there's 10, 11, 12 or more different forms yeah. of magnesium. They have mm -hmm. magnesium ascorbate where you get vitamin C and magnesium together. That's a perfectly fine product. And there's not only not anything wrong with taking it, it's an excellent thing to take. But in my opinion, from my analysis, it makes the amount of magnesium and vitamin C that you want to take in a given day too expensive because it's a more pricey supplement when they put the magnesium and the ascorbate together than if you take a magnesium product and an ascorbate product, vitamin C separately. Mm -hmm. So these are all different circumstances that somebody has to figure out for themselves, what they can afford, uh, the different things that we're talking about. Uh, I, I'm still very impressed with the anti-pathogen effect of magnesium chloride. And I just think uh, not only with the pandemic, but with all the other pathogens that seem to be, shall we say, descending upon us, uh, the more that we can get uh, chronic levels of anti-pathogen agents in our blood, the better. Yeah. Uh, and magnesium chloride is an excellent one for that. As I mentioned, I, uh, you know, you got to look at some circumstances and say, well, if they're not lying, that's unbelievable. And so, like I say, you know, with regard to the literature on Dr. Nouveau in France, I said, if they're not lying, that's incredible. Magnesium chloride, oral solution by itself, curing polio very readily, very easily, and even reversing some of the more advanced cases so that some of the paralysis and semi-paralysis resolves. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you have a magnesium better than that, take it, but I don't know that there is one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds good. What about this was a new one that I noticed lately, and it's in a lot of the prebiotics, probiotics, whatever they're called. It's called magnesium sterate. And I was told that that was a synthetic magnesium, that that's what they've called it, but it's not really a magnesium. Is that true? Do you know anything about magnesium sterate? Not a lot, but it, it is a magnesium product. And my limited knowledge of it is it's just a common filler for a different... Filler. Uh, uh, different pills and capsules and everything like that. You know, sometimes you ever see like <laughs> you, you buy a bottle this big and they have that much product in it. I mean, it's, it's kind of silly, but that's how they do things. So a lot of times the amount of what you need in a capsule is infinitesimal, but they want you to take a normal size capsule. So they put in fillers and other stuff like that. Uh, there is some debate and I'm not ready to take either side on this as to whether stearate is bad for you or good for you. I'll just say uh, there seems to be concern by some people that it's not a good form of magnesium to take, not because of the magnesium, but because of what it's involved with. But I'm not an expert on that and I won't go any further. Okay. Okay. So now um, I've had Dr. T Dr. Lee Cowden again and others talk about um, how many of the, like, I, I believe the, the statistic is 87%, but I may be remembering it incorrectly. So I could be wrong with that. But 80%, 87% of people who have strokes or heart attack, they all have a magnesium, magnesium deficiency. What is your um, research on that? I can't imagine there's one person that has that that doesn't have a magnesium deficiency. So okay, I would so say you agree. 87 percent is probably a low Hello. estimate, but you know, <laughs> you know, you, you you can't go crazy. And whenever you start saying everybody's got this or nobody's got that, you get tuned out. So so mm -hmm. so very little in biology is all or nothing. Okay, but in some cases there are things that are all or nothing in biology. You just need to know. Uh, which ones they are and make sure people understanding you uh, are not feeling that you feel the need to exaggerate something to be heard. Correct. Correct. What about contraindications? So there are people, you know, <clears throat> that take other medications. And, and by the way, if you guys have any questions for Dr. Levy, please type in a cue, write your question down, and we'll ask your question before the end of the class today. So um, with people taking medications, um, and I was, as I was doing my research, you know, they're talking about people with they're taking antibiotics, blood pressure medication, diuretics, um, pump, uh, uh, was it proton pump inhibitors and blood sugar uh, lowering medications. And to me, 
when th th there's a like, don't take magnesium when you're taking these drugs, take the magnesium and don't take the drugs. That's my idea. But what would you say about that? And I'm sure the lawyer side of view is going to come out too. <laughs> you know, I'm not aware of any, any significant contraindications of taking okay. any particular magnesium product along with anything else. So uh, a lot of times you can run into theoretical problems. You find an animal study that shows this or a test tube study that shows that. But unless I'm shown a clear clinical study where this form of magnesium antagonizes or is antagonized by another one, uh, I, I don't, I don't tend to pay attention to it. Okay. So what are some of the things about magnesium that you want us to know? I know we talked about, um, you know, calcium, copper, and iron, and maybe we'll do our, our next class on that, but let's talk about magnesium and some of the things that we need to know about magnesium. And I love the fact that it's a natural calcium blocker. And to in the cell. So are there are any other things that we need to know about magnesium that does help our body? And maybe uh, are there any negative side effects other than diarrhea that you can share? Well, the thing to remember about magnesium as a calcium channel blocker is calcium channel blocking is a primary form of a type of drug used uh, for treat high blood pressure. So the more you prevent calcium from going into the cell, uh, the more you make that artery flexible and e able to relax and lower blood pressure. <clears throat> Magnesium is so effective against blood pressure that the, if, if, if you wanted to make a point, I'm not recommending it, obviously, you can like dial up any blood pressure that you want. I mean, you put an IV with a high enough concentration of magnesium and you can adjust the rate so that you can just bring the blood pressure from 120 to 110 to 80 to, to 40 to zero, okay? So you can definitely uh, overdose on magnesium, cause hypotensive shock. It's not easy to get there, but just because of the fact that that's what it does pharmacologically is something to be aware of. And because of that, it also accounts for some of the most incredible other effects that magnesium has, which is, is covered in the book. If you look at all the literature, it would appear that your number one way to deal with a migraine headache is magnesium. Magnesium is a vasorelaxing calcium channel blocker, and it brings magnesium, and mag migraines start with vasoconstriction and then vasodilation that causes the headache. Uh, the same thing with seizures, it would appear that magnesium properly administrated is really your number one agent for a seizure. Again, I repeat for anybody saying, well, why are they using this? Money, 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 okay? Show me and, the if money. Can, and if you can't appreciate the difference between a $2,000 pharmaceutical and 10 cents worth of magnesium, I can't go much further on that point. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, so that's why it's all money. For goodness sakes, stop thinking. If you're listening to me right now, Stop thinking forever, especially after this pandemic, that you think for a second, the number one concern of modern medicine or your private physician is your health. You're severely deluded, except in the rarest of circumstances. <laughs> okay, what other things? Because magnesium, okay, now again, with magnesium for people that have migraines, taking magnesium, um, is there a particular magnesium that works better or just, again, the magnesium that you're taking will help? Yeah, the magnesium that you're taking, it, it will help. Uh, the other one. thing that, that helps a lot, and it's important to remember too, is magnesium is an incredibly potent antitoxin, okay? Uh, and for example, not something that most people are going to have the opportunity to work with, but the best two things when somebody presents with an overdose and they're comatose, uh, you wanna get as much vitamin C on board as possible because the vitamin C will start to reverse the damage that was done by the toxin. But just as important is to get magnesium on board. Why is that? Well, just like it prevents and treats seizures effectively, it also stabilizes neurons because when you have an acute overdose, much of the time, not all of the time, much of the time you have 
a massive increase in calcium inside different cells in your brain and in your heart, okay? I mean, you have electrical cells in your brain, you have electrical cells in your heart. When you get the excess calcium inside the electrical cells of your heart, they're prone to extra beats and arrhythmias. And far too often, someone will die of an arrhythmia from an overdose before the, before the vitamin C has any chance to have its effect. So getting magnesium on board quickly brings that calcium level down <clears throat> and causes the reduction of a measurement called the QT interval on the EKG, which is unimportant to understand, unimportant for you to understand, except for the fact that when this QT interval stays prolonged, the heart cell is highly unstable and can tr trigger into a fatal arrhythmia at any time. So these are the ways to treat overdoses. And it also, again, underscores the many different properties that magnesium has. What else? What else can people take magnesium for that they didn't even know they could? I love the migraine uh, <clears throat> observation and uh, overdosing or um, toxins in the body taking magnesium. What else can you? Um... Well, without sounding grandiose, everything. Why? The Why everything? Because I. what did we say at the start of this is that 100% of disease is characterized, caused by, and associated with excess calcium inside the cells. And the magnesium is the number one way to bring it down. It, it's such a, an important relationship that the magnesium and the calcium are yin and yang. You cannot have, impossible to have, elevated levels of both inside the cell. Once you get one up, the other goes down. Okay, so that's how they interact. And so when the calcium is in, is in excess, it keeps the magnesium down. But when you're able to get the magnesium in there, you start pushing the calcium down. Vitamin C and other important antioxidants in the cells start increasing. And you get this wonderful side effect called good health. I love that. Okay, what about testing? <clears throat> How do you test? Because <clears throat> sometimes there are certain tests that we do that are absolutely are, are not even close to showing us the real picture. Is there a particular test, um, a blood test, or I know that you talk about the calcium score testing as well. Um, can, you, can you talk about how that, uh, how we can learn about how much calcium is in our body from that test and how magnesium can help and can, um, and also what kind of testing blood work wise is recommended to find out your true magnesium levels? Well, the coronary calcium test, although it's long used to look at your chance of heart attack, turns out now that the higher it is, the higher your, your, your all-cause mortality. So it's clearly an indicator of excess calcium everywhere in your body and not just in the coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, with regard to, uh, uh, yeah, so what was it? What was, uh, testing, uh, testing. Testing with blood. regard to testing. Uh -huh. uh, they do magnesium blood testing. And it's important to realize, though, that the normal level is not normal, okay? Uh, what is significant is if you do a magnesium test on your blood and it's low, you have massively low levels of magnesium in your body because only about 1% of the magnesium in your body is in the blood. The rest is inside the cells. And of the cells, 95% of it is in the mitochondria. So you need massive amounts of magnesium to gradually go against that gradient and build things up. So you only know that you're massively depleted if it comes back low. If it comes back normal, you still need magnesium. You're just not as in drastic need of it as possible. And what is the for name some of the test? What for some people who absolutely feel they got to know or the doctors want to know, they have something called the EXA test, E-X-A-T-E-S-T dot -E com. And this actually takes cells with a swab from inside your mouth and literally looks at the intracellular concentration of magnesium, which has been found to be very reflective of the magnesium found on muscle biopsies, which is sort of the gold standard. But for the most part, I don't really see the need to do that. But if, like I say, there's some reason that your doctor just has to know how close you are to normalcy, that would be the test to do. 
Very good. Okay, so um, so I, I, I don't, sometimes there's like serum tests and there's like regular blood tests, and so I'm I'm glad that we discussed this today. You are amazing, Dr. Levy. I hope that people will start looking at magnesium in their body and taking magnesium supplements or in their foods. There's lots of foods that have magnesium, and then you can supplement that. So thank you so much for making us aware of this. And next time we come up, we're going to be talking about calcium, copper, and iron. And please remember, we'll be right here waiting for you worldwide at whenyouneedafriend.com. This is Lillian McDermott and Dr. Thomas Levy wishing you love, peace, joy, and unexpected abundance. Make it the best day ever. Good job. Go to peakenergy.com to learn more about Dr. Levy. The opinions and advice expressed on the Lillian McDermott radio show are intended for the individual callers and guests on the program and are presented to our wider audience solely for general educational purposes. Please act responsibly and consult personally with your own medical, psychological, or nutritional expert before taking any steps to improve your life. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We'll 